Shall we pray? Father, we come to you this morning with the hunger that you created in us. In us, in the old self, there was no desire to know you. There was no hunger. Because no man can come to God. No man can know God unless you draw us to you. How can we come? You touched us. You drew us to yourself. You put this hunger in us. And only you can satisfy that hunger. And only your word, your living word, not the word of man. So the living word of God can satisfy that hunger. And I pray today once again, Lord, you will speak to us. That this man will decrease. That beyond and above the voice of this man, we will hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit ministering to us. As it did to Elijah on Mount Horeb, I pray you will minister to us too, because you are the same God. Yesterday, today, and forever. Speak to us, O Lord. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you remember last Sunday? Elijah. I want to go back to James chapter 5. I told you we can never, never discount this man of God. We do at our own peril. Chapter 5, second part of 16 and then 17 and 18. Be effective. Follow Prayer of a righteous man awaits much. We would have preferred God wrote it, wrote it like the prayer of any man availeth much. But that's not what it is written. It's written the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then not to give us a complex. When we read that we get a complex. So not to give us a complex, God says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. So you don't need to have a complex. He was a man just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. He study Elijah. We don't see him anywhere earnestly pray that it should not rain. It's not shown to us. God doesn't lift the veil of his prayer closer when he shuts heavens. So we don't know. We can only assume, we can only presume as to how, what happened. It's not been mentioned. All we know is he's suddenly coming out of nowhere and we have no clue who this man is. He's just called Elijah the Tishbite, and he comes to King Ahab and says, The Lord has spoken. Until my word comes, it's not going to rain. And that's it, and then he goes. But when it rains again, God lifts the way of his prayer closet and shows us how he prayed. That's important. That's important. But he shows us more than how he prayed. He also prayed, showed what he did before he prayed. There's a lot of things that happened in Elijah's life before he could open the heavens. See, if I'm right with God today, and I'm obedient with God today, and I have a hidden life with God today, and I hear the voice of God today, and God tells me, speak that it will not rain, and I speak it doesn't rain. The next time it's going to rain, according to God's own word, is three and a half years. Let's say September 2012. He tells me, now if the rain has to come back through me as a vessel, it has to be in March 2016. How should I walk from now till then? Oh. 
It's not only important for me, it's also important for the nation. The glimpse of how he walked from the beginning of his ministry, public ministry, till the next time it rained is shown to us. And what is shown to us is how God prepares his servants. How God prepares his servants. It's interesting to note that even at the time of Elijah and even at the time of Elisha, they were Bible colleges. It is there, the school of prophets. They were Bible colleges. And even at the time of Jesus, and even at the time of John the Baptist, they were Bible colleges. It's also interesting to know neither Elijah, nor Elisha, nor Jesus, nor John the Baptist was sent to any one of them. Yet, all of them taught the Bible students. Understand that? That's why these people are important in the Bible. They're very important in the Bible. We are all students of the Bible. And we look at these men through whom the Holy Spirit can teach us. So last Sunday, we saw Elijah on Mount Carmel all alone. I'm telling the children, wherever you are placed by God, if you want to stand for God, usually you will end up alone. At every stage, there will be a set of people who will start leaving you. Very few will come with you all the way. Finally, when Elijah went up, he was all alone. But Elijah was not the only believer in Israel. There were 7,000, God himself says, whose knee had it bent to bow. There were 100 prophets hiding in two caves. And there was an Obaidah whose heart was divided with his God and his master Ahab. But there was only one man who was willing to stand there up in the public, up alone, and willing to risk his life. Different kinds of believers in the church. Different kinds of believers in the church. That's why everything in the Bible is given in terms of word pictures. And even when the tabernacle is built, you have heard it over and over again, but a lot of new people are there. Let me tell you, when the tabernacle is built, there is the outer courts and the inner courts, the holy place and the most holy place. Everywhere there is a ministry that is taking place. This is a ministry that takes place in the outer courts. Levites of this sea. There's a ministry that takes place in the holy place. There's a ministry that takes place in the most holy place. But at every point there is a separation. There's a separation. In the ministry of the outer world, it's open and there is plenty of natural light. In the ministry of the holy place, there is little light. It's the little light that is from the candles. But in the most holy place, there is nothing but God. And very few people in the Bible enter there. And when they entered there, when they came back, they said, Thus says the Lord. They had nothing to say about themselves. Elijah's ministry is from there, straight from the most holy place. He has met God there and come and spoken. That's why when a man like that trips, God sends his angels to feed him. He said, I don't condemn him. I know him face to face. I know that man. I know he stood where nobody stood. I know he stood alone for me. So don't judge him by running to Israel. You want to judge him? Judge him that God sent his angel to him and fed him and said, walk 40 days and come meet me, I'm going to talk to you. How many people did he do that in the Bible? So we need to be very careful taking one incident, we use it only as an object lesson, but using that one incident to judge Elijah, we need to be very, very careful. Because on that fateful day in Israel, Elijah stood alone. And remember, the land had been devastated by drought and famine. And we all want God to bless us. I don't know what kind of famine you are going through. In the old days, famine was connected. Lack of blessings was always connected with rain. Yet scripture is very clear. God cannot genuinely bless and restore until we are humble before Him. 
It's the brokenness in us that moves the heart of God. What is Elijah trying to do over there? He's not trying to do something of getting his fire over there. His entire purpose is to bring the people back to God. To see that they have humbled themselves before God. Any ministry that hasn't finally moved people to humility, to humble themselves before God, that ministry fails. But you need to realize, the famine did not do its work. It's very strange, right? Three and a half years of severe drought, there's no food. Even the king is going miles and miles looking for fodder for his horses. That's the kings of this world who look for fodder for his horses when the people are starving. Sounds familiar, right? There's so much pain, there's so much suffering, but when the prophet comes and tells, if Yahweh is God, choose God, if Baal is God, choose Baal, the people say nothing. It's still the same. Don't think hardship will make a person humble and turn to God. Then everybody who is going through suffering should be turning to God automatically. Most people don't. Most people don't. Most people grow bitter through sufferings. Very few people get better through sufferings. That's why in His mercy God sends His servants. God in His mercy is sending a prophet while the king is trying to preserve his horses. And we need to ask ourselves, I know many of you have gone through real rough times. How close have you come to God through the rough times? It should be asked, when if people are not moved towards God at all by their sufferings, why should God send an Elijah to them? Because he's a merciful God. Why should Elijah go through all this suffering? Why? He, only a man, who understand the heart of God for his people will go through what Elijah went through. This is not ministry. He is not trying to do a ministry over there. He has understood the heart of God. That's why he is willing to be broken for God. He realizes how much God loves his people. If you are in ministry, and you want to be in ministry, if you don't love his people, get out now. You will not stay the course. You will not finish your course. You will never finish your race. You will not. Elijah was a man like Moses, like Abraham, like Paul, who loved people, God's people. And he was willing to suffer for God's people. That's why though there were 7,000 others who need had been bent, and hundred prophets hidden in two caves, God could only find one man who would go face Ahab and go to Mount Carmel and face 850 false prophets. Let me tell you, God has been always clear about blessings. Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 to 2. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to also carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You don't, you, you don't have to worry about blessings. All you have to do is listen to my voice and obey me. The blessings will automatically keep coming into your life. Meaning, they will be for chasing you and they will overtake you. Yet he also said, on the other hand, if you don't, in Deuteronomy 28 verse 15, we don't read all the blessings or the consequences. Verse 15 he says, verse 15, 28, 15, one time, it shall to come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which he command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. 
He also said the consequences of breaking the laws of his kingdom will automatically come to pass. This was said hundreds and hundreds of years before Elijah comes. Look at Deuteronomy 30 verses 15 to 20 what God says. 30, 3, 0. Deuteronomy 30, 5. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to, to walk in His ways and keep His commandments, His statutes and His judgments, that you may look and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set you, set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. We want God, God to be impartial, but God is a loving Father. He says, I said before you life and death, blessing and curses. I say, I gave you free will, but I also said, please choose life. Teachers who help students in the examination. Madam, is this the right answer? Say, I love you so much. I know you. You can make your own choices, but let me tell you, choose this. If you choose this, you will learn. If you choose this, God has always set choices before us. And even this morning, when we are sitting here, you are making choices. Choices either to control your wandering mind and listen, or sit here and wander all around the city, or maybe even abroad. Choices. We are making all the choices. And we don't even realize that choice may have eternal consequences. Maybe in that one hour of preaching, there was one word specifically for you from the Holy Spirit and you miss it. Miss it. Because you made a choice. Everything are choices. Like Israel did. We too have choices. And the new man, born again man, wants to follow God, but the old man wants to follow the world. Sadly, many people sit for years in the churches saying nothing, like the people on Mount Carmel, while inside their lives are falling apart. That's why if you remember those three days, scripture says, and the pastor said, if you are not honest, you will never receive your deliverance can put a mask in the church. I am fine, my baby is fine, my bachya is fine, my kutte is fine, we are all fine. When you go back home from the kutte to the baby, everybody is fighting. And you are miserable, but you put this. And there is no deliverance. There is no deliverance, year after year after year after year. There is a loving God, a merciful God who says, I want to bless you, I want to give you life, life in abundance. This is the reason I came and paid the price in my blood, nothing seems to change because we don't want to be honest to receive our deliverance. And Elijah was there. I want to look at something differently. Hours before the fire fell, the false prophets of Baal were caught in a predicament. They had accepted the challenge. And now, they were doing everything, jumping and dancing and cutting and everything and nothing is happening. After the turn, Elijah's turn came. Elijah did everything according to the word God had given him and fire came. And after fire came, people humbled themselves before God. They went on our face, they cried out Yahweh's God, they obeyed the prophet, destroyed sin in their midst and then Now he is caught in the same predicament as the false prophets who are already dead. Earlier Baal didn't answer, 
Now it looks like Yahweh also is not answering this second part. You have to be very careful here. What happens? What happens? Look at the other side of it. There are two ways you need to realize. The false prophets, when there is no, when your religion is false and you do not get a response from your God, your activity increases. That's a lot of religious activities only because you haven't heard anything from God. And you think by your religious activity, you can make him to say something. And he doesn't even say anything. They are dumping, they are dancing, they probably are singing, they are doing all kinds of things. God is absolutely silent. Do religious sense activities signify that God is silent? Because we think God is tickled pink by our activity. But this is where the difference comes. When rain did not come, what did Elijah do? First Kings chapter 18 verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. Unless we keep reading scripture closely we will not get the point. The point is this. When Elijah came to Ahab and called the prophets of Baal, the competition or the test was only this. Whichever God answers by fire is God. God has answered by fire? Yes. Now Elijah can go home if he wants. Go home if he wants. Because God has answered. So he can go back to Zarephath and stay hidden for the next four years. That was the test, right? He tell the prophets of Baal and after that the God who brings rain. No, that was never mentioned. Read your scripture care. It was never mentioned. The people probably after killing the prophets have all dispersed back home. They are slowly going back home talking about this great fire they saw on the mountain. God sending fire. They have this sitting probably in his camp eating and drinking. And what is this man of God doing? He's going up the mountain alone. Back up the mountain. He had come down the mountain to destroy the false prophets. He's climbing up the prophet, the mountain alone with his So, This is what is recorded in James chapter 5 verse 17. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. I'll put it this way. It says, he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. This is why I am saying, now God is showing us something. He is lifting the weight over his prayer closet. There is nobody there. Please don't confuse. The people have gone. They have come down the mountain to the valley, far away, killed the prophets. The people have gone. Down somewhere in the valley is the king. Alone is he there. All alone with his servant. That's when God shows us what kind of a man he is. He's on his face before God. Take up the mountain, always in the Bible. It's either symbolic of war or prayer. First, Elijah separated himself from the people, from the king, and goes up alone up the mountain. So that the people can experience the rain. Most people, even in the church age, experience the blessings of God, but they never see the man or the woman who has separated themselves from the people and have been on the face before God. They never see them. And they will come and testify, you know what, I witnessed and I did and a word of faith they confessed and God my blessing. God says, you have no clue. You have no clue why you are here. You have no clue even why you are alive. There was another man or a woman who climbed up the mountain alone and was on his or her face before me so that you could get blessed. 
on all the earth in Israel, people will be soon dancing in the rain. The king is feasting. But all heaven sees is one man on his knees before God. That's all heaven sees. I said, remember, in the challenge, nothing of rain had been mentioned. Only fire. What I want to ask you is, how far will you go? How far will you go? Okay, we had a revival, let's say in terms of that. We had a revival the past three days. Up to today, you come to church, you worship, you pray, you listen to the word, and then you go back home thinking, the rest of the Sunday is yours. How many of you will go back home and a little bit later get back into your prayer closet? How many of you really do? Elijah did. The others all went home, okay. We did our part. Fire came, we worshipped, we destroyed sin, and now we are going back home. One man went back up the mountain. That's what God is talking about. Everywhere God says, my eyes are going to and fro the whole world, looking for one man, one woman whose heart has stayed on me. And if your heart has stayed on me, you know the coming down of fire hasn't finished the work. The people are still suffering. The people are still in bondage. The bondage is not over. The bondage will be over only when the reign of the Holy Spirit comes down. To cast out demons is one thing. To fill that empty space with the truth of God's word is another thing. This is a spectacle. In the name of Jesus. Ooh, wow, what a spectacle. Like Mount Carmel. The other is hard work. That is hard work. And how many will do that hard work? And if you have done the hard work, how many will go up the mountain interceding so that others will do the hard work? Just remember again. The only person who ate without worry and anxiety during the three and a half years was only Elijah. He was the only man in Israel who didn't have to worry about his provision because he knew it would come. Because God had promised him. And the only one who became part of the blessings was a widow and her son who opened their house to the prophet and Fed him. So there were three people who didn't have to be anxious. And yet, probably two of the three is up there on the mountain because everybody thinks the servant was the widow's boy. His name is not mentioned. They think it is that boy or young man. Men and women, this is what I have to tell you. Don't stop at the fire. Don't stop at the fire. Stop only after there is complete restoration. For that you have to go up the mountain. Look at Matthew chapter 14 verse 23. Mark that in your Bible. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. What did Elijah do? He sent the people away. People went home. And he went up the mountain to pray. What did Jesus do? He blessed the people, fed them. 5,000 plus people ate out of a miracle of five loaves and two fish. And where did he go? Went back to the mountain. Did you see the ministry shift taking place over there? Mark chapter 6. Verse 45 and 46. Mark chapter 6. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to the bedside of, while he sent the multitude away. Now what did he do? He sent the disciples away in one direction, sent the crowd away in one direction. Where did he go? And when he had sent them, he departed to the mountain to pray. Chapter 6 and verse 12. When 
came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. People will come for all night prayer only if people come. You didn't get it. You will come for all night prayer only if there is at least a small crowd. How many of us would be willing to go into a separated place on our own and pray through the night? Jesus. He had a close set of disciples who left everything to follow him except go up the mountain to pray. They were everywhere else. But he went up the mountain alone. Luke 21, verse 37 and 38. Seven. And in the daytime he was teaching in the gym, but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Why did they come in the morning to hear him? Because he went in the night up to the mountain and heard from his father. So pastors, young people, who know, or who know, or believe they have a call of God upon their lives, when will the people come to hear you in the morning? When you have spent the night there. That's what Elijah is doing, climbing up the mountain. And this is the very Son of God. Then, finally at the end, at Gethsemane, Luke 22, if I am right, 22, 39. Out, he went to Mount of Olives and he was up as he was. What does that mean? Will it be ever told about all of us, many of us, some of us, as was his habit, he went into his prayer closet. Is he told? Just told about the very Son of God. Why did he have to pray? Because so many people think, because I know the word so well, I don't have to pray. Well, he was the word. As was his custom, as was his habit, he went up the mountain. And his disciples followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. What did he tell his disciples? Please pray. And verse 41, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. I like the term a stone's throw. This is the person who threw stars into space, okay? Now he's been a carpenter for 30 years, so I think he's got pretty good muscles. But I guess mathematically it's talking about an average. How far he can throw a distance, he went that far away from his disciples. He says, I've been teaching you for three and a half years about what prayer is. You guys haven't come anywhere. Now this is the toughest moment in my life. I cannot pray your kiddie prayers. God bless me, God bless mama, God bless papa, God bless my doll. I can't pray that prayer. I need to go further. I need to go further. And he probably thought that if you hear me praying, you would get scared. Every step he's showing his disciples there is further to go. There is further to go. That even up the mountain when he took his disciples to pray, he went further from there and he was praying. Verse 45. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Now, one of the reasons probably he went over there was he knew their snoring would disturb him. They are all asleep. Do we fall asleep? Do we fall asleep? I am not talking about physical sleep here. This is physical sleep. God is not talking about physical sleep alone. When we are not aware of what is actually happening in the spiritual realm, that's when we are asleep. The disciples had no clue that within a few hours the master would be taken, would be arrested, would be flogged and would be crucified and they are falling asleep. And most people in the church is falling asleep because they have no idea the Lord is coming is close. Otherwise they would be putting the house in order. 
They wouldn't be concentrating on their career and their business. They would be concentrating on putting the soul right with God. Why don't they do it? Because, because they're asleep. That's why scripture says, those who are asleep, awake. Not aware of how much is at stake. And we go into spiritual slumber. They went into spiritual slumber. Do you think if spiritually they had been aware, they would have gone to sleep? They wouldn't have gone to sleep. Peter would have said, Jesus, you're going further, I'm coming with you. I want to be with you. I want to pray you through. John would have said, I want to pray you through. Instead, before, little before they were fighting for positions. They are actually spiritually blinded. They have no clue. And sometimes we can be in the house of prayer, God's house, and be absolutely blinded because we have no clue what is coming. Because our spiritual eyes have been shut. Where do you think Elijah's prayer, his faith came from? Let me ask you this question. God told Elijah to go to chariot. Did he go? You are already seeming to be asleep. Did he go? God told him to go to Zarepa. Did he go? God told him to go to Carmel. Did he go? And I surely believe God told him to take the false prophets down to that valley. Did he go? Does it say God told him to go up the mountain? Why did he go? In Chronicles chapter 7, he knows in Israel's history when fire of God came into their midst. Verse 1 to 3. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. This is their collective history. They knew there was a moment in history in their time when fire had come down in the midst of all Israel and consumed the sacrifice. That was in the morning. In the night, the Lord himself came to Solomon. And he told him something which is very familiar of, but we only read it out of context. Verses 12 to 14 of the same chapter. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Then he told him something. In future, if these things happen to your people, to your nation, let me tell you, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Elijah knew that. But Elijah also knew there was none humble among them. So he said, I will be that man. I will be that man. I will be that man. Because I know what my God has promised Israel. You will turn away. You will go to other gods and I will shut the rain. But if my people who are called by name will humble themselves, then I will send them. That's why he went that day up to Mount Carmel and fire again came down. When fire came down, the people all humbled themselves. But what happened? After humbling themselves, they all went home. Nobody went back to pray and seek his face. So again, the man of God has to go up the mountain all alone. Understand how your ministry will be going when you start planting churches. I'm telling you future pastors, you will sweep your church alone. You will swab, you will clean the toilets, nobody is going to come to help you in the beginning. 
You will set up the chairs, you will lead worship, you will pray, you will preach. Sometimes you your only wife who will be there and nobody else. That's how most churches are planted. Not on stages. And then when God sees you are serious, he will start sending the people. Most of pioneering ministries is done alone. Then only the people will come. The people only want fire and the blessings. But they don't know how the fire, what it costs the man of God to get the fire and the blessings in. They don't want to know. We are not willing to pay the price. If somebody pays the price, it's okay with us. That is one of the reasons why God says, Does not my, does not my, anointed. Why? He says, you have no clue what they have come through to reach this place. How dare you who has never been in the closet interceding for another man, who was never for a watch night service, who was never there for any of this meeting, stand there and judge him. The reason he says that, the reason he says, everybody has paid a price to receive an increasing anointing in their lives. He says, you judge her or him from outside, but you have no clue. I have judged their life entirely in the prayer closet. I chiseled them in chariot. I shaped them in Zarephath. I saw them on carnal students standing all alone, willing to risk their head for me. I saw them going down to Kishon Valley and destroy sin in the midst. And then when everybody left and the king himself was eating, anticipating the rain, he climbed the mountain all alone and he was there on his face before me. Only he, the only one who didn't need the rain. The only one who didn't need the rain. Just like Moses. All the people he brought out of Egypt were slaves all their lives. Yet they were the ones who were always complaining, Oh, Egypt was better, Egypt was better, Egypt was better. You know how we lived in Egypt. You know how we ate in Egypt. Most people have turned around and said, What do you know about Egypt? Do you know how I lived in Egypt? Have you any clue what I ate in Egypt? We are talking about garlic and leeks and cucumbers. Have you seen the inside of my palace where I lived? Never complain. But every time God opens a picture of Moses, he's on his face before the, before the people. God says, move and fight. God says, no Lord. Go and fight. And he says, no Lord. Please, Lord, what about your name? And these are your people, God by your name. And Moses and Eliza, these are genuine leaders. Genuine men who knew the heart of God. That's why I said, do not make the mistake of judging Elijah by Jezreel. Because Elijah knew how much was at stake. That is why scripture will record, he did not rise until the rain came. We don't know how many hours it took. We have no clue. Whatever you are praying for, you have no clue how much it will cost you. But really, really, do you know what is at stake? Do you know what is at stake? Remember the Canaanite woman? Luke chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Not that. Matthew 15, sorry. Matthew 15, 21. Matthew 15, 21. And Jesus went out from there and departed the region of Tyre and Sidon. Back to the same place where Elijah was earlier. And behold, the woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon precious. Very strange. We very rarely hear something like this about Jesus in the Gospels. What does it say? He answered her. Not a word. The question is, if God doesn't answer your prayer, what will you do? If God doesn't speak a word to you, you cry out and your need is genuine. Your child is dying. And you cry out, Lord, 
Please, Lord, touch my child. And he doesn't say a word. But our eyes need to be open because when there is a physical ailment, a physical deformity, a spirit of infirmity, we all see it because it's very visible. But I wish God did a spiritual x-ray and showed us our lives. We would cry out to him like this. If he were to really show us how messed up, warped our spirits are and how close to perdition, destruction we are, we will cry out for our sons and our daughters and our family and our friends, desperately like this. And if Jesus doesn't say a word, we will not go. And what the disciples say? The disciples came and said, send her away, for she cries after us. And he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. What if God says something to you like that? Say, Peter comes and says, Pastor, pray for me, Pastor. I need a financial breakthrough. So I ask him, Peter, do you pay your tithes? And he says, no, I don't. And I will tell him, God doesn't bless thieves. He's got a choice. To humble himself or walk away. A choice. To humble herself. He's doing it deliberately. Humble herself or walk away. She doesn't walk away. What did she say? She said, yes, Lord, what you said is true. But let me tell you, Master, now she's giving Jesus a Bible study. She's telling, Lord, even dogs eat crumbs that fall from the Master's table. And he looks at him, oh woman, great is your faith. How many times in the Bible did he say, great is your faith? How many of them were to believers? None were to the believers. They are always Gentiles. Great is your faith. You are humble. You are persistent. You remind me of Elijah. You will not rise until you get your request. I like that kind of people. You are not wearing any mask. Oh, how dare he call me a dog? What does he think he is? Who does he think he is? Doesn't know who I am. She's desperate. And because she's desperate, she wants an answer. God says, how desperate are we? How desperate are we? Turn to Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. Luke 18, verses, and then he spoke a parable to them. That men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Most of us lose heart. Usually we pray once. And we expect immediately, like instant coffee, God to answer it straight away. And if it doesn't, we get it. I have other ways to do it. God says, go do your way. I've got no issues with it. How many of you have prayed through until you see the result? When you know this is right in the sight of God. I got saved in 84. My father died in 94. Two days before he got saved. Ten years. So all the people you are praying for will only probably get saved after you are dead. But that doesn't mean till your last breath you will stop praying for them. But there are certain things that are always right in God's sight. That is the salvation of souls. Not the prosperity of your business. The salvation of your souls. It's always right for God. And God loves those kind of prayers. So when Moses stands in the gap, when Abraham stands in the gap, when Paul comes and says, Lord, take my name off and put the name of my enemies over there, when Elijah is on his face for his people who doesn't even care, God says, you know what, those are my kind of people. When I look at them, I see myself. That's the kind of people. Take the picture. Go back to First Kings 18.42 onwards. Yes, he went up, put his face between his knees and then said to his servant, Go up down, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. 
Seven times he said, go again. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. Question is, do we give up when the circumstances don't tally with our prayer, though we know the prayer is right? Think about Elijah that day, on his face, before God. If you look out, the entire skyline is absolutely blue. There's not even a speck of a cloud anywhere. You look down the mountain, all the mountainside is parched, there are no trees, everything has been dry. Have you seen mountains during summertime? It's dry, bare. And this has been summer only for three and a half years. If you look down the valley, everything is dry and cracked. That's the reason Elijah tells, you need to read word pictures over there. Why does he tell Ahab, get into your chariot and rush before you are stopped? Because when in a land, it hasn't rained for such a long period, when it rains, the land doesn't rain. Instant flash floods take place. Because the land is so hard like a rock now, flash floods will come. So it's saying, get ready, run for your life. It is so dry. Broken parts, the mountainside is bare, the sky is blue. What does Elijah say? Go, look. He doesn't raise his head. See the picture? Now look at another person in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, who was somewhat like Elijah when it came, not letting circumstances stop her. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 42 to 48, second half of 42 to 48. Am I getting it all confused today? It's the woman with issue of blood. Luke chapter 8. The verses are right. Only the chapter. For here only the less leave Jairus. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her life on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. Immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. And you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me. For I pursued power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Everything in her situation, in her skyline, and the circumstance and surroundings told her there is no hope. There is no hope. Twelve years, it was famine for her. Not three and a half years, twelve years. Second, all her provision she has run out of. Until that day she heard Jesus is passing by. What good is to her that Jesus is passing by? Because you are a Jewish woman. And you got an issue of blood. And your Jewish law says if you have an issue of blood, you are unclean. And if you are unclean, you cannot touch anybody because you made that man unclean. And above all, a rabbi. And if he is like any of the Pharisees you have met on the streets who walk away you from women and shut their eyes when they see women, and you will see the number of knocks they have got on the head, more spiritual they think they are. That's how they walked. How do you touch him? But the very law that tells you you are a child of God tells you you cannot touch him. Where do you go? Then you are old, definitely old. You are weak. And when you see, what you see is a massive crowd around him. It's very easy to read five verses and say, okay, there was a miracle. You don't know what it cost her to cut through, push through the crowd, quietly push. I don't know how she managed to do that. Probably without touching anybody. 
She has to do two things. One, I need to touch the hem of his robe. I need to be careful I don't touch his body. Two, while trying to touch the hem of his robe, I should be careful not to touch anybody. And the problem, the crowds are there. How she did it? I have no clue. No clue. She did it so well that Jesus himself didn't know. Even he didn't know who touched him in his flesh. Yet there was something. When Israel came out of Egypt and rules were being given and daily clothing was being mentioned, God said something. In your daily clothing to remind you that I am your God and you are my people, you are called to walk in righteousness. In your daily clothing, put a little small ribbon around there. That will tell you, you are mine. For this woman, she couldn't tell Jesus what her problem is. She couldn't even touch him. She couldn't even face him. But according to her law, there was one point of contact which would tell him, I am yours. That's why she bent down and touched the hem of his robe. God said, you are healed. You didn't go allow your circumstances to dictate your miracle. You broke through everything and you reached and he said, who touched me? Peter said, everybody is touching me. He said, no. Everybody here sitting is not touching me. He says, among who is sit touching me, you will know who has touched me because if you have touched me, virtue is flowing into you. And I'm asking you the question this Sunday morning, is virtue flowing into you? Because everyone who touches Jesus, virtue will flow into them if they are touching my faith. It has never stopped. He is still the same Jesus. Even more virtue flows now than then. And when she saw, she was not hidden. And I believe in that crowd, he looked around and he stopped. He looked at her and she knew she had been found. And she comes and gives her testimony. That's what happens. She came trembling. Expecting to be lashed at, how dare you touch me, you unclean woman? You have defiled me, and now I have to stop my meeting and go for a ritual washing. He didn't say anything. That's how the Pharisees would have reacted. Remember in Simon's house, when that woman with a bad reputation was touching Jesus, he was thinking in his heart, doesn't he know what kind of woman is touching Jesus? Jesus looked at him and told him what he was thinking. Imagine, that's what she expected. That's not what she got. He said, I'm a father. I'm a father. The entire purpose of the Lord was to reveal to you that you are my children and I'm a father. These are the rules in the home. I'm a father, you are my child. Go home. Be healed. Just be healed. Just simple as that. We do we understand that we don't let circumstances allow the enemy to steal our miracle? Because God has already spoken. He has already said, if you do so, 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 according to my word, I will do so, so, so to you. Because I love you. Do you know, your reign is not just a little while ago. Are you going to listen to the testimony of this young man who keeps on coming and saying, I see nothing, I see nothing, I see nothing. He actually has theology and say this man is a widow's son. He has experienced miracle before his eyes in his home. He had seen at the point of death when his mother had pronounced death in their lives, when the prophet comes and says, no, I speak life. You are speaking death. We have this much akka, we have this much oil, we will make two chapatis, we will eat, lie down and die. He said, no, make it and give it to me. He had seen how his mother had spoken life and he had seen how the prophet had come and reversed it. And then he had seen from that day till that day, the flour, nor the oil, nor food, provision had run out in his house. He knew how one day he had died. The last thing he remembered, he was lying in his mother's bed and he was gone. The next thing he knows, he's living up in the prophet's bed. He's come back to life. He knows what is the divine. 
This is the man who comes and says, I see nothing, I see nothing, I see nothing. This is the danger of being and walking with an anointed man of God, a prophet, and yet learning and experiencing nothing from his life. Let me tell you, the last place in scripture where you will see this young man is at Beersheba. And there, Elijah will leave him and go up to Horeb. When he comes back, you do not hear anything about this young man. Instead, you hear about another man whom God says, anoint him to take his place. You hear everything about this young man again. Though he has served Elijah without ever understanding Elijah's God. There's so many people who serve men and women of God, never ever experiencing the God of those men and women. To take you nowhere. To take you nowhere. That is why when one celebrity comes to the city, whether it is a Joyce Mayor or Benny, everybody will run to the stage, oh I wish I got a photograph with her, and they will frame it and put it in, you know. Did you see my Joyce Mayor? Oh, did you see this handkerchief Benihim ministry sent to me? Framed and kept. Why don't you blow your nose on it? If it's got anointing. To cure your sinusitis. Why do you want to frame it and keep it? Because you never understood their God. That their God was your God too. You had the same answers as they had. That's why you ran about Christian celebrities. This man followed Elisha all those years, yet Elijah all his years, yet he never understood Elijah. That's the danger. That's the danger. This is what Jesus is talking about. Verse Luke 18. Another one. How do you know your breakthrough isn't just around the corner? Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. What did he say? A parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from, from my adversary. But he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, And shall God not avenge his own elect, Who cry out day and night to him, Though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, Will he really find faith on earth? Are you riding my faith on us? Because what happened after the revival meeting we went home. We forgot to go in the prayer closet. After the revival meeting was over, God had decided at 6 p.m. when they all go to pray, I will visit them. Nobody went. So he said, when I came, I did not find faith. They were excited in the flesh. They all jumped and danced and went home. Nobody went to pray. Will I find faith? Will I find faith? Well, I want to amend speedily. I want to intercede on your behalf. That is why I keep telling you, men ought to always pray and not lose heart. Do you know one man in the Old Testament who is mentioned in the New Testament? Do Elijah. He refused to lose heart. The servant kept on saying and saying, Master, I don't know what I am doing here with you. My life also will be in trouble. You kill the prophets and the people are expecting rain. The king is expecting rain. You told the king, eat and drink, rain is coming. I see nothing. Now the people who kill the prophets are gone. The king and his soldiers are left. What are we going to do? Where is the rain? Elijah doesn't lift his head. He said, I don't have to see. I heard in my spirit. You go. You go look. You go look. I have heard in my spirit. And God has never gone wrong. He has never gone wrong. That's what Spurgeon said, if I'm right. Spurgeon who said, What God told you in the darkness of your closet, do not forget in the daylight. Do not forget. Most of the stuff we have heard from God which led us was heard in the darkness of the prayer closet. When we come out in the light of all the people, we start wondering, Did I really hear this from God? God says, Don't doubt me. What I told you, it will come to pass. Elijah knew what God had told him. 
and he was not going to let a servant who looked with his eyes and couldn't see anything take the blessing from the people. He said, it will come to pass. It will come to pass. Seven the time the young man came and said, you know what? I see a little sunrise. Knox's version of the Bible will say, I see a footprint in the skyline. A little footprint in the skyline. Tiny little footprint. Turn to Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3. The Lord is low to and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind, in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his. It is a man on his knees. Pray for what? Lord, clouds, clouds, clouds. First time, second time, third time, hour after hour, the only report is coming. Nothing. Then at the seventh time, God says, <laughs> and there is a cloud rising. The cloud rising. And the people who neither prayed nor carried are going to receive the blessings. Now what will the people go back home and say, you know what, I was zealous for that day on Mount Carmel, I killed the false prophet, that is why it rained. God said, you have no clue. That's how the testimony sound in the church. You know how zealous I was for the Lord on that day. That's why my blessings came. God said, no, there's somebody who was in the closet, day and night interceding, and I answered him or her. Please remember, God is always working out for his elect. God, Elijah is banking on God's faithfulness and God was looking for faith on earth and he found it in Elijah. Person, man, who told an old servant of God, asked this question. Where is the God of Elijah now? And his answer was, where are the Elijahs of God now? Where are the Elijahs of God now? It is easy to get Elijahs who will come and say, Lord bless my people. It's difficult to get Elijah who will say, don't touch my people until they repent. Take your hand off them, Lord. Let them repent. Then blessings. The tough call as a pastor, right? So the question is, how can we be persistent in our prayers? How can we be persistent like Eliza in our prayers? Only when we know like Eliza, all that we are doing is in accordance to God's will. What we saw that day is an altar being prepared. What we saw that day is a trench being dug. What we saw that day was a bull being cut. What we saw that day was water being poured. But you know who all that was? It was Elijah himself. If he had failed that day, that would have been him. They would have killed him. For he could come there and do everything. He himself had to be drenched in the water of God's word. He had to practice in the Old Testament what Paul wrote to us in the New Testament, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. He was offering himself as a living sacrifice that day. Lord, I've never seen fire come down from heaven in my life. I've never seen. I've heard, I've never seen. Today, if it doesn't come, I am kosher meat. <laughs> I'm done. I am finished, but Lord, at your word, I will do it. At your word, I will do it. Once we know, that's what scripture says in Romans 12. Look at Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. For young people who keep on asking, how will I know God's will for me? Here is the answer. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. That's when you will know. When your body and your mind, your soul is in God's custody, you will know what His will is. 
Most people keep the body for themselves, the soul for the world, and say, Lord, I give you my spirit. He said, that's mine anyway. You didn't do anything about it. And we want to feel so spiritual because I belong to you, Lord. All my spirit is yours. God said, it was anyway mine. That's where the struggle comes between faith and sight. The report of the sight will keep on, keep on, keep on coming back. I see nothing, I see nothing, I see nothing. Have you felt like that every time you have applied for jobs? No, 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 no. What do you do? Apply for more jobs. Why didn't you go to the prayer closet? I have nothing against prayer requests. I have nothing against prayer requests. But my advice to you as a pastor is, this should come to the pulpit after you have been in your prayer closet. Don't outsource your prayers. Outsource your prayers. We will pray. We will definitely pray and I trust God will answer. But you know what? On that day you will be judged. Because he said, you know what? You did not take time on your own to intercede for your own needs. Forget others. You thought it was the church's duty to do it. If you have not been in the prayer closet, then he says, why do you keep on sending prayer requests? Why? Because you were not willing to be Allah and Elijah. You were not willing to be a living sacrifice. That place is a very lonely place. That's why people don't pray. Very lonely place. Did it say, this servant, if it was that young man, the widow's son, did it say, when the servant saw Elijah on his knees, he also went on his knees beside him. He said, I keep telling the worship team all the time. As soon as you come into the church, get in and start playing. Before service is not fellowship time. Keep playing, doesn't matter. Let this anointing flow that people will be compelled to pray. But you do your part. You have to do your part. You don't have to be told to do that. Does anybody have to tell me I need to preach? You may have to tell me to stop. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Don't be offended when I tell you these things. Because offense is not of God. Often our prayer requests are cries for justice. Let me tell you something. God never asks us to seek for justice. He asks us to seek for righteousness. They both are not the same. Both are not the same. Let me tell you, let's say Brother Peter. Brother Peter has come from Nigeria and he has set up a company. He's a believer. He's a company. He's a so a so, so believer who believes only in going to church and he set up this company and he's having issue with all his workers some workers come at one hour late some workers leave early nobody put in a full day's work and then he puts this petition in the church Lord deal with my workers that they will have work ethics goes as a petition before the Lord has justice. And God will take it and say, Peter, I will judge you about your work ethics in my kingdom. How much time did you spend in the closet before me? How many times did you go to church this week? How many times did you go to the pastor and say, Pastor, I am here. Whatever you want me to do in the house of God, I am available. I will judge you by the same yardstick. You want a justice? I will give you justice. what we don't understand. That's when Jesus says don't ask for justice, ask for mercy. God is a merciful God. Because if we ask for justice in this world because people are behaving with us unjustly, he will say I will seek justice from you in my kingdom. Then I will be just to you. And everybody who is just in his kingdom who gives the hundred person into the kingdom is always crying out for mercy in the world. 
You need to understand the difference. Always crying for mercy in the world, then asking for justice. Because they are devoting their time into the kingdom. When they go to the world, when they see a weaker man, believer or unbeliever, they are always trying to help him out. Because saying, Lord, mercy, mercy, Lord, mercy, help him out, Lord. Help him. They'll put in a word to the manager saying, okay, give him a little more time. He is weak. I will try to help him through. Or he's a student. He's not good in English. I will try to help him through. Don't fail him this time. Why? Because in the closet they have understood that God is a God of mercy and have experienced mercy at his hands. I need to go back into the world and show mercy. That's where we get it all mixed up. I think. God says, you know what? When you put your petitions for justice, you are substituting my righteousness with your righteousness. And I have always told you, your righteousness is like filthy rags before me. It is self-righteousness. My God loves people like Elijah. People are wrong. They have this need He's all alone. Even his servant is not praying with him. Did he get up? Did he get up? Did he say anything to anybody? He's on his face before God for the people and for this king. When the seventh time a little cloud comes, what does he tell the servant? He tells the servant, go and tell Ahab, escape, otherwise you might die. I say, yes, 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 let the blood come, let it wash Ahab of his, not let that man go home, he shouldn't die before God's time. Who am I to kill? God has kept him there, it is God's business to take him up at God's time. Go tell him to run. We need to understand God's heart. God is not interested in justice because the day is come and the just one will come. Right now, God is interested in mercy and his people who are seeking after righteousness. Righteousness and justice are not the same. Mark 14, verses 32. Go up the mountain. It's a lonely place. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Now, don't get offended when you see things happening in any church. In any spiritual church, things will happen in, all, in its own way which God directs. Because even Jesus did. Eleven disciples are there, and he told them, Sit down. And pray. Then you pick three and say, You three come with me. Because I have watched your prayer life for three and a half years. You come with me a little forward, please. Come. Little. He separated three there. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. Why didn't he tell the others? Pastor, I don't share everything with everybody. You know what? Some people will be fearful. Yo, persecution is coming. I am going to die. Very few will say, I am ready. I am ready, Pastor. I am waiting for that day. And my faith will be true. So Jesus also didn't tell the others. You need to realize there has to be discernment used within the body of God. Everybody is not made of the same metal. Everybody doesn't use the time that God has given profitably in the kingdom. In building their spirits up. So he also separates there. He also separates. He separates three. And he tells them he is troubled. Did you see a separation? And come to verse 35. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass away from him. So there is 11 minus 3 is how many? 8. Here. Three here and one here. See? What are they all supposed to do? Pray. Each prayer is different. There is a fleshly prayer taking place here, a soulish prayer taking place, there is a brokenness in the spirit taking place here. Even there God separates it into three. Prayers are different, it's not all the same. It's not all the same. And Jesus couldn't even pray with this three because he knew when he started really praying, they wouldn't understand. So he separated himself. But now, 
In this age, after the Holy Spirit has come, if you know how to pray in the Spirit, Jesus will join with you because He will intercede up there. He exactly was saying what I'm saying up there. Testing. Luke 22, verse 45. When your prayers are from the flesh or from the soul, what happens? When he rose up from the prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. They couldn't pray. If you have not been touched in the spirit, if you do not know how to pray in your spirit, you will be overcome. Soul cannot handle this. And it will fall, you will fall asleep. In the spirit we can pray for hours without ceasing. And you will rise up even more strengthened. That's why it says if you pray in tongues, your spirit is edified, strengthened. And you don't see any change. When you step out and face your problem, you realize I'm ready to face it. And he prayed in the spirit and he got up. And he said, I am ready. But there's an interesting episode that is happening here in John chapter 18 verse 2. Another gospel writer mentions it. Judas who betrayed him also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. There was another person who knew the place. Even in any church it is divided that way. It will be different. So some people you ask fasting and prayer. They will say fasting and prayer is on the third Saturday. This is where it meets and we pray from some and I enjoy it. I wait for the day to come. Some people will say yes it's on third Saturday. It is there but I struggle. Some people will say I think it is on third Saturday. I've never been there. People have knowledge, information. Some people have some level of experience, some people are actually warriors over there. That's what's happening. Judas knew the place. He knew. He knew where Jesus met with his disciples. He knew about the prayer closet. But flesh comes to the prayer closet only to accuse and to betray. Always noticed in this 18 years in the ministry, whenever flesh has come for a prayer meeting, they have gone back and slandered what happens there and never come back. That's what you tell this. To be persistent all the way. It's what is at stake. It's more than your life. It's an eternity. Understand the picture. As I told you before, a young man experienced God's provision, experienced God's miracle of life, walks serving this prophet, goes up the mountain with prophet, the prophet sends him out, he comes back each time saying, I see nothing. Then a little later, he is left with Beersheba and Elijah goes up to Horeb, has an encounter with the living God, and the living God gives new instructions. says, when you go, go back, you will see another young man. That young man, you have done no miracle in his life. He doesn't know what provision of God is. That young man was not from, brought from death to life by your ministry. Just go to him, take your cloth and put it over him. Okay. Twelve yoke of oxen, but the last yoke is Elisha, son of Shaphat, right? And there he is going, Elijah comes and puts. You don't have to explain to that man any theology, anything. He said, can I say goodbye to my dad and mom? Man was more prepared without ever meeting Elijah for the day of Elijah than this man who had walked with Elijah for over three years. And Elijah looked at him and said, Goodbye to your dad and mom, what do I have to do with him? What does he do? He kills his oxen, cuts up all the yoke, cooks it, gives it to all the people, signifying my past life is dead, today I follow this man of God. And he goes, never turns back. The day comes, years and years have passed. The time for Elijah to go has come. Elijah comes to Gilgal and says, 
Elisha, stop here. You don't have to follow me. I am going. This is my last journey. And he says, you must be kidding me. I'm using 21st century language. I ain't leaving you for anything. Goes to stop number two. What is that? Bethel. Fifty sons of prophets fresh out of seminary are there. And they said, do you know your master is going to be taken today? He said, of course I know. Who do you think I am? Whom do you think I am following? The anointing is upon me. I know he's going today. And they have a prophecy about Elijah going, but nobody follows Elijah. Elisha said, I am leaving you here. Come to Jericho. Another 50 prophets. And they said, do you know your master is going today? See, everybody has got a prophetic vision. Everybody is being told Elijah is going. They are not getting the significance of the anointing of the prophecy. The significance of the prophecy is today Elijah is going and one man is going to be chosen had to replace him. Why are you not following him? Because the 50 here at Bethel, the 50 here are at Jericho, nobody wants to pay the price Elijah has paid. The stand far and says, this ministry which we have today is enough. Elisha says, no, it is not enough. I want what you have. Come to River Jordan. Elijah takes his cloak off and he splits River Jordan. But remember what he has told him. This is my day, I am going. And it's already been confirmed to at least 100, 150 prophets. And one group of prophets have come part of the way to watch the spectacle. And they have come and they saw Jordan part. It is easy for Elijah to cross because he is going. Elisha follows him without knowing whether he can split the Jordan to cross back. When he crosses back, he knows there is not going to be an Elijah. Who is going to open up Jordan for him? He knows. I am going to follow him and I want to get to that mantle. Cross Jordan. Elijah asked Elisha, okay. You're persistent. You're really a praying man. You're really a man of faith. Now tell me, what do you want? He says, I want double portion of your anointing. He says, anointing is not mine to give. There's somebody who gives the anointing. But let me tell you something from experience. If you see how I am taken, you receive it. Why did he say that? Because your first servant did not see servant had to go seven times and six times he came back and said, I see nothing. Elisha did. First time he saw and he says, my father, my father, the army is of the God of Israel. I saw. God says, receive. Take your anointing. That's how God's kingdom works. Those who are persistent in following God, persistent in their prayer life, persistent in the study of word, persistent in walking in mercy, God says you will inherit everything. You will see and you will receive. That's how the kingdom operates. And that's what you heard last week. A persistent in following God. Putting off, putting on. Putting off the old man, putting on. Putting off, putting on all your life. Those who endure till the end, what does scripture say? Will be saved. Will be saved till the end. end. So there is a putting off and a putting on. A putting off and a putting on. And the more you keep putting on, you start seeing how God's kingdom works. This is how the kingdom works. I need to put away. I need to put away. On the way you will meet many people who have already decided, this is as far as I go, I don't want to go any further. And God says, let them stay there. I am pushing anybody. If that's what you want in your ministry, that's where you will stay, he says. That's where you will stay. Then, anointing falls, anointing falls, Elijah is gone, and Elisha steps that clock. Rips his clock aside. That's it. Now I will not walk under my old anointing. I will walk under my new anointing. I have put off and I have put on. And then he takes the clock. What does he say? Where is the God of? What does he mean? I want to know now where the God of Elijah is the God of Elisha. Where is the God of Elijah? And he hits 
and river Jordan pass. And all those who were on the other side said, ah, Elijah is anointing has come upon him. Now what will they do for the next till Elijah, Elisha dies? Follow after him. That's what happens. What happens? There will be a man or a woman or whoever it is or many of them who have persistently sought the Lord, sought the Lord, sought the Lord and his kingdom and his righteousness and God starts revealing his stuff to them. Then there are these others at Bethel and Jericho and Gilgal and all. Go back and learn their preachings and their studies and give it to the people. Because they have never heard anything from God directly. Because they decided, I am satisfied where I am. I don't want to take that road. Don't be one of them. Don't be one of them. It's good to learn from great men and women of God who have gone ahead of us. But that shouldn't be all that you learn. You should be able to sometime in your life stand forward and say, Thus says the Lord, I too have heard from that same God. It's when Martin Luther's king, Wesley's king, God. We talk about all these people, name all of our churches after them. Say so close, shall I read about Wesley? This is the page. Wesley's actual diary. Not this, I've written it. This is not a, a page. A page from John Wesley's diary. Sunday morning, May 5th, preached in St. Anne and was asked not to come back. St. Anne's church was asked not to come back. Sunday afternoon, May 5th, preached at St. John's. Deacon said, get out and stay out. After 5, which is the next Sunday? 12th. May 12th, St. Jude's preached at St. Jude's and the deacon said, you can't come back. Evening St. George's, evening service and I was kicked out again. Sounds all familiar, they have all these names for all the churches around. One week later, May 19th, this is his diary, scribblings, preached at St. Somebody, if he refused to write the name also, now he's one person. Deacons called special meeting and said, I could never return. Evening, priest at the street and I was kicked out of the street. May 26th, priest in a meadow and was chased off the meadow because the, pe off the, meadow because the people let loose the wild bull. June 2nd, priest at the edge of the town and was kicked off the highway. Afternoon, priest in a pasture, 10,000 people came. If he had given up after the two first two Sundays. What if he had given up the third Sunday evening service because they didn't receive his word? He said, I am giving up. I know who gave me the word. I know the one. That's what Paul says. I know him. I know who has called me. He doesn't say, I know the scriptures. He says, I know. I know him. So five people kick out of me, five churches. Wesley is saying, I am stopping this. You kick me out of the church, I'll go to the street. You kick me out of the street, I'll go to the field. You kick me out of the field, I'll go to the meadows. And one day 10,000 people came. And after that, there was no stopping. There was no stopping. And there was no stopping. Not only because Wesley was a mighty man of God. That's not the only reason why there was no stopping. Because Wesley's mother, Susanna Wesley, had 18 children. Yet, every day she spent four hours or three hours or five hours in prayer for her children. We have one child finished. I cannot take it. Where is my husband? He never helps me with the child. I don't think Susanna ever complained. 18 children she had. And she was interceding and praying that her children should serve God. That's why she had two mighty men called Wesley, John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Because she spent time in the closet so they could preach freely. So God don't happen in the flesh. It happens when there are men, women, mothers, wives, husbands, children who are willing to pay the price and say, I will stay the course. I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. What a widow son lost. Another young man got you. That's my prayer. Don't lose in the kingdom. 
Whatever you get here, it's just for 50 years, 60 years, and it's over. The scripture says, you are persistent and endure till the end. You will receive a crown. That's incorruptible. Absolutely incorruptible. Amen? Amen. Shall we stand? Shall we pray? By the way, the man, the gentleman who taught you the past five, five, six, and seven, the pastor who taught you five, six, and seven, is a simple carpenter from Kentucky. He was not a theologian from Fuller or Trinity. He was a simple carpenter. And what does he do over there? He does carpentry and teach in the church. So if you are a carpenter, or if you are in the professional, whatever it is, that doesn't mean you cannot be called of God to teach. Anybody gets a job in the world, they think that is full time. Then God becomes part time. Whatever you do in the world is part time, remember. What is God in your life is full time. That's the reason we have all this. So that we don't miss our prize. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, this morning, even as we are here, Oh, Father, your plans and your purpose for us, so much bigger, bigger than we can ever imagine or fathom of God. For your word says, I have not see, no ears heard what you are preparing for those who love you. And you also said, those who love me will keep my commands, who will follow me persistently. Doesn't matter how many times they fall, they will cry out, they will reach out and they will get up and they keep following me. I pray, Father, you will raise up a generation who will follow you till the end. They will not let their failures or their disappointments stop them. Then, even if they run from Jezreel, you will meet them and take them up the mountain with you. You will see them, the manna of your word, strengthen the spirit and whisper your mysteries to them. And then when they come and speak, people will know that this is of God. Touch your people here. Touch your children. Especially all those who got baptized on Saturday. And all those who allow your Holy Spirit to do a spring cleaning, a house cleaning, that they could serve you even more. I pray, Father, that each one of us here will serve you with an undivided heart. We will no longer falter between two opinions. Yet, for those who are far behind in the race, I pray each one will show mercy, will show charity, true charity. Because it's not our job to judge another man's character. That's your and your call alone. And I pray, Father, everyone in your house will allow the word to judge and will not judge where authority is not given. That they will always extend mercy and help a struggling brother, a struggling sister, a struggling child, help them on the way so that they too do not miss their crown. Let there be genuine love, O oh Master, genuine love in your body, as you had. You died, not just that we could be saved, but also that we could receive the same crown, the same love, the same throne that the Father is giving you. Pray, Father, that you will teach us to see the same way, that we are not competing with one another. We are just running our own race. And there are enough crowns in the Father's treasure for everyone who finishes the race. Help us to see it. That if I help my brother to run the race, I'm truly helping myself. Oh God, help us to see things the way you see. And not to be worried and anxious about the things of this life. Because they are all ordered and tailored 
by you so that we finish our race successfully, victoriously. Thank you, Father. As we go into another week, may your presence go with each one of us. Help us to put you first. And as we have always heard, to keep the first commandment as the first commandment. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our strength. To keep it always first. And we know, Lord, if we keep it first, the rest will follow. Thank you, Father. I speak blessings in your children's life. True blessings that comes after fire. True blessings. That the dry souls will be drenched in the rain of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, let your rain fall upon their souls. That there may be fatness in our souls. Fatness in our souls. Not leanness. Because answered prayers can lead to leanness. We have heard it from your word. But after the fire has done its work, the rain that comes will bring fatness into our soul. I pray, Father, let both happen. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit continue to work in the lives of all of us. And let the refreshing rain of the Holy Spirit fall on. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We praise you, Lord. We worship you, God. We glorify your holy name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us. Amen.